Vice President of Community Investment for your Akron Community Foundation. And we'd like to thank today's panelists and all of our participants for being here today on this cold and snowy day here in uh, Akron, Ohio. Um, we are very pleased to, to welcome our guests today and uh, Christina will introduce them in a little bit. But I first wanted to say how proud we are of our partnership with our Akron Public Schools and all the work that we have done together as, as a community foundation and as a public school system. And uh, none is more evident than lately with our um, participation in the middle school transformation process. And for those of you who are not aware of that project or initiative, uh, we encourage you to look into it. Um, my colleague, Darlene Schuler, who is uh, APS staff person, but is housed at the Akron Community Foundation, is currently working with nonprofits all throughout Summit County to uh, create uh, experiences for our middle school, school students in town. Uh, Darlene, I ask you to please put your contact information in the chat so that people know how to contact you. Uh, we are very proud that to date we have a, a, over 25 nonprofit organizations who have joined forces with us, and we look forward to that list growing in the future. Um, again, we welcome you on behalf of our board and staff, and I will then turn it over to Christina, who will introduce our speakers. Thanks so much, John, and thanks to all the participants uh, and attendees here. I am pleased to introduce our guest speakers for today for today's community issue session. Uh, I will introduce them in the order in which they will be presenting to us today. So born and raised in Akron and educated in Akron Public Schools, Superintendent Christine Fowler-Mack is an experienced school district leader who was named superintendent of APS in 2021. Fowler-Mack's experiences in the field of education led her to raise student achievement and graduation rates dramatically and to increase community and parent engagement. She is a Martha Holden Jennings Scholar and recipient of Summit County Leadership Academy's Emerging Leader Award. Fowler Mack was also named APS Coach of the Year and is a recipient of both the Heights Association of Black Schools Educators Award and the Cleveland Heights University Heights Schools Educational Leadership Award. Additionally, Christine Fowler Mack is listed in Who's Who Among Educators and Women in Leadership and is a 2019 Northeast Ohio Women Leading and Learning in STEM honoree. She's a graduate of the first cohort of the American Association of School Administrators and Howard University's Urban Superintendent Program and participates in the National Coalition of State and District Chiefs for Change. Brandon R. Scarborough is the founder and executive director of Dreams Academy. Wanting to make an impact in his community, Brandon founded Dreams Academy in 2016 after noticing a lack in programming for African-American male youth. Since its inception, Dreams Academy has engaged over 400 men in the Akron and Cleveland area. In the summer of 2021, Dreams Academy expanded and started Queen's Academy, which has had over 25 young women participate in the program. A third initiative, Bridges Academy, will launch next week. Bridges Academy is a platform bringing high school juniors residing in Summit County together to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion. Brandon is proud to lead the organization and looks forward to impacting more youth in our community for years to come. And finally, <laughs> <laughs> to our third uh, guest speaker, a distinguished and educational leader and author, Tracy Buckner is the executive director at Akron Children's Museum, a vibrant interactive space located in the heart of downtown Akron, designed for children to learn through play. Buckner joined Akron Children's Museum after 18 years of service in the Akron Public School System, and most recently as program officer at JR Foundation. She is the founding instructional leader of the National Ventures Hall of Fame Schools Center for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Learning, and most recently served as Director of Specialty Programs, where she led the district's effort to expand STEM best practices throughout APS and to develop and direct innovation efforts in the district's non-traditional schools. She also authored the book, STEM Leadership, a guide on creating STEM culture in a school or district, as well as children's book, We All Make Tracks. Wagner has gained broad recognition for educational leadership and civic engagement. She consults and speaks locally and nationally on creativity and innovation in education. So please send a virtual round of applause to our three fantastic guest speakers. And with that, I will open the floor to all of you and uh, give it over to you, Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christina, and good afternoon uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, my sincere thanks also to John, you and your wonderful staff there at the Akron 
Community Foundation for allowing me a chance to be with uh, these dynamic and accomplished other leaders here in the Akron area, uh, Tracy and Brandon. They actually are two of my favorite people uh, and to be a part of today's community issues session. Thanks also to the ACF board uh, for the many contributions being made to life in Akron, both as representatives of the foundation and also leaders of the Akron community. We are very indebted to you. As the largest pre-K through 12 educational organization in our city, committed to diverse learners throughout the city, where might we be without the strong and ongoing support of the foundations in our city? As the proverb rightly states, it takes a village uh, to raise children, especially today. We certainly do not take for granted the Akron Community Foundation and others who have remained committed to our work and to partnering with us. When I was asked to speak to the Akron uh, Community Foundation, uh, you all here gathered today, someone suggested I talk a bit about what it's like uh, to come home. Uh, as this person put it. Uh, well, for starters, um, I was only in Cleveland. Uh, again, as uh, it was already stated, my parents live here, both whom are graduates of APS and have been lifelong citizens here in the Akron community. Uh, one actually was a former board member uh, here for the Akron schools. So shares my love for the schools on lots of levels, uh, Ron Fowler. So I took advantage of the close proximity then while working uh, formally in Cleveland and living there to spend a great deal of time in Akron, which I found to be so helpful uh, to maintaining the relationships that are sustaining me now as I've take, taken on this new role. Now, if you were to ask the question differently, not just how it is to come home, but how does it feel to be the superintendent of the school system you attended as a child and the district that gave you your first teaching and coaching job, one word comes to mind, incredible. I love my job. School was always a happy place for me. And I also felt very cared for in the Akron Public Schools and as a member of the Akron community. So right now, I like the fact that I get to serve my community with even with some of the colleagues I worked with so many years ago. I like the job even on days like today when I rose at 4 a.m. to monitor the weather for today. Uh, in rising to do that, it was an honor to do so in making a really difficult decision that often uh, has persons who uh, like it and persons who actually are um, a bit annoyed. Uh, but prior to being selected to lead APS uh, with the team here, I outlined six goals for the school system. I pledge to, as a leader, build trust, build a trusting and collaborative and effective working relationship with the board of leaders here and our effective board of education to establish trust and a collaborative relationship across a variety of stakeholders through being visible, through listening, learning, to better understand the strengths of our system and our city, the future aspirations and needs. Again, I pledge to listen and learn before leading. I also uh, pledge to address learning loss and the social emotional impact from the pandemic, build upon things that were already working here in a strong way to support our culture and climate, to ensure a strong leadership transition between Dr. James, a very uh, exemplary leader and friend uh, who was transitioning out and to prepare for um, some of the secession uh, work that would need to be done here. And lastly, to build on the excitement and momentum that could be established through increased engagement, um, communications and visioning exercises as we look to the future. It has been six months since I assumed the role. I'm very pleased to report that those six goals are well underway. I am also, as I anticipated, learning quite a bit about the operational and programming needs and opportunities of the future. To be completely honest, some of the identified goals have required a bit more time than others. For instance, I am not sure any of us could have predicted the ongoing adaptations and supports that COVID-19 crisis would still require of educators and the educational 
environment uh, of our staff, our systems, and our practices. Words like PPE, contract tracing, social distancing, testing, transportation dynamics, uh, the list has just continued to grow and be so much a part of our day-to-day -day life. Along with those setbacks uh, in some areas and challenges uh, experienced by our students, we've also been challenged to respond a bit to the impacts on our students. Our students return to us in an in-person, more consistent ways with much need in terms of mental and their physical well-being, along with the academic needs that they hold. Um, our staff as well, we have had to ensure that we are not only serving, uh, but caring for each other because our staff as well have needs and need to be able to attend to their mental and physical well-being, as well as being productive uh, workers here in our system. The full impact of this unprecedented time period is likely to show itself for many years to come. Yet for every challenge that we are successfully facing, there is a bright ray of hope and progress is being made. We remain focused on excellence and better opportunities for every child. We are seeking to innovate and to create a more effective and equitable system, which gives me and the entire team the energy to persevere and thrive. We have also gone through parallel challenges, uh, not only in the academic space and social emotional space, but challenges of staffing, uh, which is commingled with uh, the impacts of the virus economic forces, and the fact that we have an aging workforce across America, which is also true in the Akron schools. Even our district administrators stepped up and stepped in. Um, they went back into classrooms as teachers needed to be a way to attend to their health because of COVID or that of their families uh, and friends uh, in some smaller districts. Even I read about superintendents taking the wheel of school buses. So uh, everyone has been really uh, contributing in many unique and different ways during this year. Or those superintendents uh, transporting vans uh, to fill in where necessary. Um, I can uh, report to you, I think you would be very pleased to know that I have not taken the wheel of any buses, uh, and nor do I hope to be doing so anytime soon. Our staff, again, has remained committed, and even through those types of adaptations, we have found ourselves each and every day able to function and run schools due to the flexibility and adaptability of many. We are hiring more and more people, even as we speak, we offer many opportunities uh, for educators, bus drivers, classrooms, assistants, paraprofessionals, and more, so that many more people, we hope, will continue to join our team and to step in where needed. Uh, the progress is continuing. The opportunities for our students in APS are amazing and are diverse. Uh, we offer programming like College and Career Plus dual degree programs in partnerships with many of the universities that surround us. We have, I hope you already know, the College and Career Academies of Akron, which is a transformational effort uh, for our students K-12. Right now, we are in high school uh, on the precipice of immersing our middle schools. And so, as you heard, Mrs. Schuler, supported by you, is making the connections happen in the middle as we continue to design for uh, the experience, a stronger experience for our elementary students. On the visual and performing arts end, we wholeheartedly believe that we have a great trend going in our schools um, and that unlike it is true other places, we have not de-emphasized the performing arts and the visual arts, uh, but are seeking to really enhance the quality of education that our students are getting in the Akron schools. The International Baccalaureate Education program is now woven into all of our elementary schools in some way in the Firestone cluster and at Litchfield Middle School. Firestone is the innovator, the pioneer, having had the IB program to challenge students to a more rigorous 
education for years to come. And we are expanding that and continuing to learn from them and the other schools in the cluster. Esports and robotics clubs, uh, our VEX Rocks robotics tournament teams are some of the best in the nation and the world. So we're very honored to be able to sit back and see our students leading the way in those spaces. We now offer APS Plus, our after school support center that provides students and families with help and resources, now including a 24 hour a day access to tutoring and support after the school day has ended. Our students come from all over the world. We are among the most diverse public school districts in Ohio. Thanks to our many students who come to us from the region around the Himalayas, we speak nearly 50 languages now in the Akron Public Schools. I bet you weren't aware of that. So to do that, we employ many translators, English as a second language teachers, and we work with Asia Inc. and the International Institute on happy, helping these families in any way we can. We are, we are having open arms here at APS and really enjoying the benefits of who we are, which is that we are diverse, uh, committed to excellence and serving the needs of each and every student. We also have a growing list of online offerings. However, um, with the online offerings, we want you to know that we haven't forgotten the benefit of the quality of interaction that takes place when students are with us in our schools each and every day. While greater use of technology and education has been valuable and designed more and more these days with intention, technology will never replace the interaction with a great teacher, nor will it rival the opportunity to be in a diverse, vibrant, and supported learning community like we afford the students in the Akron schools. The Akron Community Foundation has provided funding support for so much of this work. You've already again heard how uh, you are helping us. Uh, you created the partner liaison position to support our middle schools. We're very proud of Mrs. Schuler, proud of the work she is doing across the city and thankful that you provided that for us. The infusion of support like this is vital to our district perhaps even more so today, when we need to be forward facing, but also responding in the here of now. Much of what we still benefit from today comes from families and companies that prospered long ago in the Akron community. Philanthropic generosity helps community development, education, the arts, and more. In APS, we are able to expand our programming and support to ensure that our students and staff can learn develop and experience even more. We're preparing our students for the future. So we're still continuing to look in that regard. And we are hoping that we will continue to have external resource to support things like our family resource centers. Our goal is to have one per cluster. We currently have five and we need two more. We are working very earnestly with the support, ABLE support of United Way. We are looking to increase our expertise and capacity for the work here. So we're starting to utilize fellowships and really partner with others to increase our capacity to serve uh, our students better and more ably. We're providing additional supports for students, which is a place where we continue to seek resources for student support. So individually, when our students have needs to make sure that they have access to all of the opportunities that they can do things like uh, get their driver's education, uh, enter a program to get their license, to be able to access internships, college credit plus programming and summer work opportunities. Sometimes it's the small things of helping our students be able to be um, uh, able to take a part of all that we offer in our school system. We still have much to do. Um, I'm sure the challenges will continue to face us, but with the right vision, with the right support and mindset, I believe we are poised for a very, very bright future. I really feel fortunate as to be the superintendent in this district where we have businesses, families, and a community 
truly supporting our schools. Your involvement in our schools is not only important, it's critical. It makes a difference. More importantly, you're making a difference in the lives of our children, families, and caregivers. We have children who will be born in the next five years who will still be living, still be with us in the 22nd century. What does the 22nd century learning need look like? What does 22nd century readiness look like? Believe me, it's not too early to be thinking about this even now. These are questions we will be exploring in the years ahead with friends like you and hopefully with your continued support. For their future, our children stand to benefit from the teamwork between our school system, families, our community supported by community foundations. Students can learn at increasingly higher levels if they have better access and opportunities and preparatory education really planful. Working together, we can ensure that our children will thrive. And when I say thrive, I mean thriving is what our, when our students are making real progress, when they're ready to be scholars, leaders, and citizens. Thank you for being a part of our army of believers, our supporters. Now I'm going to turn it to my friend, Brandon Scarborough. He's gonna tell you a bit about his work through Dreams Academy. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much, Superintendent. Thank you for all you do. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon R. Scarborough, and I'm uh, definitely glad uh, to be able to share with you um, on behalf of Dreams Academy. Um, I, I thought I was a bit nervous at first, and I saw a lot of my friends' uh, names in the chat and got a couple of text messages about who, who all is uh, watching, and so that, that made me feel a little better. And so um, Dreams Academy is, is our organization that we started back in uh, 2016, 2016. Um, there was something on my heart that I wanted to feel a need um, in our city. I, I did a little bit of research and found that there were, if not any at all, um, very few programs that were dedicated to young black males. And so um, I, I wanted to do something with them because our young black males, um, they, they are a population that have a great need. Um, many of them come from single parent homes. Many of them do not have great relationships with their fathers. And so there's a, a great need for um, black male adult mentorship relationships and, and, and leadership. And so we started in 20, 2016 in my grandmother's uh, storefront church on the west side of Akron um, in the summer. We had 11 guys come out every Monday and we taught them things like tying ties, um, how to speak uh, articulately, um, what communication looks and sounds like, how you should shake hands with people and look them in their eye when you're talking to them. Some basic lessons that we felt young men need to, um, need to know as they continue to grow into young adult leaders. And so um, I'll tell you the truth, from, from that starting, my intention was to only have a summer program. I was working a job at the time and I had the summer off. I was working in education, had the summer off. And so I just wanted to do something that summer. And uh, lo and behold, here we are five years later and now this is my job. And so I'm grateful um, to be in that posi position. And so that summer went extremely well. Um, long story short, I was let go from the job I was working because I started Dreams Academy. And so um, when we got to that point and that summer was over, my parents said, well, it looks like you need to continue because you don't have anything to do anyway now that you don't have a job. And so um, I'm glad they, they put that word into my spirit to do so. And um, like I said, five years later, um, as Christina mentioned, we have Dreams Academy. We have Queens Academy now, which is for our young ladies. Uh, Bridges Academy starts on Monday with high school juniors, um, where we are giving them a platform to, to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as speak out on it and get to share their views as they are coming to schools and deal with um, different perspectives and dip different backgrounds. And so we're excited about, about that. Um, Dreams Academy, we, we have our independent programming, which takes place three times a year um, in the spring, summer, and fall. 
Um, our guys meet on Monday nights for eight weeks. Our young ladies meet on Wednesday nights. And um, we just take them through themed lessons and curriculum to enhance their, their lives. Of course, our young ladies curriculum looks totally different from our guys and is, is really put a light, a fire under me to uh, do better with my guys because now the girls are getting an overload of support, which is really cool. But I'm like, hey, don't forget about my guys. You know, they're, they're still here. So, um, but it, the, the, the support has been phenomenal for both. Um, our independent programming, um, it, it's, it's not in partnership, I would say, with, with anyone. We get all of, our, all of our kids from the community. However, of course, uh, a large majority of those students come from, act, from public schools. And so we meet with them and uh, we talk with them about, you know, even what's on their heart. We even ask them, what would you like to do? And so, for instance, um, many of our guys, and I'm sorry, our, our age bracket is 10 to 15. Many of our guys, of course, are interested in money but they're, they're critical thinkers. And so this last session, they want to learn about real estate. And so I found a young guy who I was connected to who is 25 years old and works in his full-time job is, is real estate. He flips houses. And so he took us on a tour. And so we went, uh, we got in our van and took 15 guys to tour his, um, his rental properties and his investment properties. And we even went in one of the ones that was being rented uh, maybe that next Monday. And so they got to see, you know, some before and some after type things, but those are the types of tools and resources we're instilling in our guys um, because college is not for everyone. Um, and at this point, I think we've learned, especially through this pandemic, um, that we have to be creative in what we're doing. We have to be able to be um, flexible. And uh, these guys that are coming up, these, these youth that are coming up, they have so many different interests and whatnot. And I think we have to be flexible enough to cater to those um, so that they can be successful. Um, as far as partnership with Akron Public Schools, the work that we've done inside the building in 2018, um, the first year of I Promise School, we were there working with a third, and, third and fourth grade boys, um, which was a really phenomenal um, adventure for us, especially being the first year of I Promise. Um, moving forward a couple of years later, we were in a book deal and in this middle schools. And if you were here when um, the uh, forum started, the video that you saw playing was our dreams guys at book deal middle school at the CLC. They um, on their own produced wrote and shot that video. I, I placed the link so you can see the whole thing um, in the chat, um, but a, a phenomenal endeavor on their part that unfortunately was interrupted by COVID. We had planned a, a video release and it was going to be a really big deal and it was set for April of 2020 and of course COVID-19 um, interrupted those plans but the, the video is still out we just couldn't of course make it as as large as we wanted to uh, which also because we were in the school in person kind of closed down uh, shop for us you know until school uh, ramped all the way back up now we're looking to uh, start here, hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll be over at the high school doing the exact same thing. And so let me explain what that looks like. Uh, Superintendent Fowler, uh, Mac talked about performing arts and because uh, I'm a musician as well. And so that's one of my passions. But what we do in our schools is that uh, mentoring and music. So we sit down with them the first part of our class time is talking to them about their grades, talking to them about um, how they're doing, emotional health, mental health, um, all the things that kind of they need to hash out that they may not get the opportunities to do. And then we go into the music part. So we're able to put um, digital music studios in the building and teach them how to use music production, digital music produ produ production tools um, as a part of what we do. And so we'll be back at a uh, at Bookdo doing that here um, very, very soon and hope to pick back up with our middle school students. And so that's sort of been our journey with um, our relationship with Akron Public. I, I really hope to build on that. Um, I would love to be in every middle school and high school in the building, hint, hint, whoever needs to take that hint and let us talk about it. But um I would love to enhance and continue to help and make an impact with our kids because I think they're great. And I think we all need all the help we can get and to support our teachers and to support our other programs. And so uh, 
that that's about all I have for you at, at the moment. Uh, I'm looking at the, the chat. I don't see any questions um, before I turn it over to uh, my friend, Miss Tracy Buckner to, to give her uh, to give her speech. So, so take it away, Miss Tracy. Thank you, Brandon. And I can remember when you were in the Children's Museum, it was a couple of years ago and we were talking. Yes, ma'am. And that look on your face was um, the look of worry and concern and, um, and look what you've built. So just so proud of the work that you're doing in the community and proud to be able to partner with you. And Thank part you. of, you're welcome. Uh, part of what, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Part of um, that work, Brandon, we were able to experience through a collaboration um, with you. It was in the height of the pandemic and we were still trying to find ways for the Children's Museum to connect and engage with families. A museum is a place where typically you can go and touch everything. And, and obviously we were not able to do that safely during the pandemic, but as uh, we started figuring out that maybe we could do some things safely outdoors, I reached out to Brandon and uh, was able to bring some of his young drummers to perform for uh, families there at the Children's Museum. And that was a, a wonderful time and just appreciate the talent and that we could clearly see uh, through the video that was shown at the beginning of this. Akron Community Foundation has been a longtime supporter of the Akron Children's Museum. And we're so grateful when I think about the topic for today, you know, the importance of the philanthropic uh, contribution for our community, I have to say that when the pandemic hit, Akron Community Foundation was so understanding, um, not just for our nonprofit at the museum, um, but I, I've heard the same uh, story over and over that they're like, do what you need to do, use these funds how you need to use them so that we can keep the uh, nonprofits that we have um, vital here in our community. So we've been able to really rebound from the pandemic in a, in a fantastic way. And a large part of that um, is due to all of the donor advised funds or even just the grant making that occurs with Akron Community Foundation, whether it's the education grant or the community cycle and coming up soon will be the capital cycle. And we are actually, we were in the middle of a capital campaign. We're expanding the museum from about 7,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. Our goal was just $500,000. I say just, but that was is not just for us. Maybe from, for some other larger or, or long Longer, um, historical organizations, it's not, um, that's a drop in the bucket. Or for us, the $500,000, um, we made half of that, we raised half of that in the first six months when we announced our capital campaign. And then everything stopped abruptly uh, that March 13th. And so now we've been able to reignite that. And I'm so proud to say that because of um, just individual donations and really some donor advised funds through people um, that utilize the Akron Community Foundation, we are about, and I think um, the museum co-founder Betsy Hart, she was on here. I think we're a little over 90% of the way toward um, our goal. So we are so very excited about that. And um, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Superintendent Fowler Mack, uh, and under her leadership, she has sent um, 1,800 kindergartners to the Children's Museum. And uh, that is happening this school year. Thank you to the uh, Director of Elementary Education, Mary Outley, who I also know is on this call for helping to uh, get that ball rolling. Over 55 days throughout the course of the school year, 1,800 kindergartners are touching down um, in the Akron Children's Museum. And so the, earlier this week, King Elementary students were there. And I was just uh, laughing because as, you know, <laughs> First of all, there was, it's always loud in a children's museum, but when it was time for them to leave, they were all lined up in their little line. They all had on their, you know, their mask uh, around their, you know, their nose and their mouth, but they also had the mask that they created in the art studio, the Andrea Rose Teodosio art studio. And they were all walking single file, file line and they were so quiet. And they just had this look of like, I played and I played hard. And so I was like, Fantastic. We have done our job, but it's, it's so much more than play that occurs at the Children's Museum. And 
um, I know that Akron Schools has a platform called Zello, and my uh, colleague, Dreama Mason Whitfield, who is the career advisor there, we talked about, you know, what sorts of things do they do with Zello before they come to the Children's Museum to learn about careers? Because in the Curtain Call Theater exhibit, that's where they can act and pretend. And that is a large part of what you do at that age, because you're trying to determine what you will look like in the future. And that's where they can try on different career costumes. And they can even test out and actually visit a museum virtually before they step foot in a physical museum. And so there was a, a young lady who we talked about who said in her Zello portfolio, she said, I want to visit a museum. She said that she wanted to learn how to do, how to plant. She wanted to, um, you know, build a rocket. And these are all, all things that can occur at the Children's Museum, whether it's in our maker space or whether it's uh, learning about careers and who they might be in the future in our curtain call theater. I can't say enough about um, the relationship that we've built with the Akron Community Foundation. And sometimes we get these letters and you know people have contributed to the museum and we don't personally know them. So we just really keep trying to do a great job so that the word gets out about us being a place where you can learn through play and people want to support that. You know, I've got two sons, they're teenagers. One went to the National Inventors Hall of Fame STEM school. It was after I was principal there. I didn't want him to have to have principal mom. Um, but before, um, when they were little, I'd have to pack them up in the car and take them to where uh, Superintendent Fowler Mack used to be in Cleveland Heights, which is where I grew up, and I'd have to take them to Cleveland, actually, uh, to go to that children's museum. I'm so thankful to have, have the Akron Children's Museum here in our community, and I'm so thankful for the Akron Community Foundation, and I just look forward to uh, continued opportunities to be able to bring uh, vitality to downtown Akron and to the community that we all love and enjoy. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tracy, and to all our guest speakers. We have not yet seen any questions. Um, so I will uh, just go ahead and invite you all back to camera <laughs> so that we can uh, interact with you and ask you, um, you know, we, I, I've heard a few things from you, from you and, your, and the messages that you conveyed. Uh, one of them, uh, Superintendent Fowler-Mag, you shared, you know, you, you pledged to listen and learn. Uh, Brandon, you, you shared, you know, being creative and flexible and, and you, Tracy, you share excitement and you share collaboration with us. Uh, out of all these three things, you know, how have you used the, these uh, in the work that you're doing to, to get through, through the pandemic and, and get through the, you know, the rough times that, that children right now are experiencing? Can you share a little bit on that and how, how we get our children through all of this. I'll start just by saying from um, the things I suggested, I, I think I couldn't function uh, if I had come through the door trying to just hit the ground running and uh, leading ahead. Um, I would have just hit a brick wall, you know, right away in terms of uh, what our expectations were for our students, for our staff, things of that nature without really honoring that commitment to listen and learn. Uh, but I think in listening and learning, we're, we're adapting. We're adapting to the needs of our uh, families, of our students, uh, of our staff members while still keeping our eye on the prize. So that, that come in the form of uh, additional support. So someone in the chat asked me about uh, were we committing to additional mental health services and things like that? And my resounding answer is yes. We have been uh, engaging in expanding the types of mental health services and we'll continue to do so. We uh, created, um, we staffed full-time counselors in our elementary schools that really uh, many shared schools or um, had part-time staff. Uh, we lowered student ratios in, this, um, in our classrooms across the city to ensure a more personalized experience and degrees of support. All of that came about from listening and learning as to what the needs were of both the uh, district at large, but also the individual needs of schools and classrooms. So in those ways, I think, you know, we'll continue to do more uh, because we haven't totally 
uh, solved everything we need to, but those are ways where that commitment has come in handy. Tracy, Brandon, would you like to jump in and add a little bit more about that? Ladies first. I think I see a question from um, Jacqueline Silas but Butler about with the lessons you learned during the pandemic, do you plan to continue uh, okay. some of the, re the remote or hybrid activities once we get back to normal, whatever that is? And, and I will tell you that through the uh, support of the Akron uh, Community Foundation and their, their grant cycle, as well as uh, combined with donor advice support, we learned from the Museum in a Box program that we offered for a Head Start, we would go you know, to all of the Head Starts and facilitate the learning. So uh, Christina actually, uh, Gonzalez Acala said that, you know, we should consider even going forward as we come out of the pandemic, this hybrid model. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and now we've created an opportunity where we can teach the Head Start educators you know, how to facilitate the learning experience. We can provide some um, post experiences for them to do. We can give them the professional development and then uh, they can facilitate that learning um, in the classroom. And uh, as a result of that support, we were able to create some dynamic videos. In fact, one of the um, teachers from the Akron schools at the I Promise School um, was the storyteller for one of the books that we authored at the museum. And so she's on video and she's vibrant and she's, you know, teaching the kids about all of the different, you know, learning standards that are appropriate at their level, uh, at that early learning level um, through video. So they can watch some video, they can have the experience hands-on with us delivering the exhibits, and then they can have a culminating activity in the museum for, for free play and exploration with their with their families. So I do anticipate us continuing in um, sort of virtual, you know, hybrid, um, hybrid environment. And then the, the last thing I'll say about that is we, as a result of support from Akron Community Foundation um, and, and some, some other supporters, we were able to create a virtual financial literacy uh, experience where they are virtually immersing themselves in the museum and they're learning about finances at the age of, um, you know, that early learning age through about um, eight eight years old. So I, I do anticipate that we'll keep it, um, but we certainly don't want to forget that, you know, it's important for children to socialize together and um, to be together and to play together. That's how we learn, you know. Absolutely. We, we have another one that came in, uh, actually a few are coming in, but uh, what can the community do to support children who suffered learning loss due to COVID? Yes, and I, I think there are a variety of things that the community can do for uh, students who um, experience learning loss. Uh, many of those students experienced oftentimes not a loss in the ability to learn, but gaps in the continuity of the, of the learning. So uh, strategies like, high dosage tutoring, um, experiences that can be reinforced uh, with, with explicit learning instruction, because what we don't want to do is to have our students feel punished, where it's just a matter of skill, drill, kill. Uh, there is some targeted instruction that needs to occur, but then also experiences that make, can make meaning of what they are learning. So uh, community persons can be a mentor, be a tutor. Uh, they can provide resources for students to experience uh, programs that will reinforce whether it's science-oriented programs or math-based programs, things of that nature. They can provide resources than that, um, I would say get connected uh, to an organization or a program or uh, share resources in a way that targeted supports uh, can occur. Um, so as well, uh, adopting a school, adopting a classroom, um, really, if you're in doubt and you want to talk it through of something that just would align with your passions and where we can pinpoint it with a specific need or even a, a specific family, please feel free to reach out uh, to me or to our team here in the Akron Public Schools because there is a variety of ways in which um, our students can be supported and need to be supported. Thank you. Uh, we also have um, 
another question is how to reinforce what young uh, folks are experiencing with their parents or primary support systems. I'd love to take a stab at, at that question. Um, so one, one thing we do at Dreams, um, because, because parents actually bring their kids, they put in the applications for them to, to come and all that, that gives us direct access to parents. And so uh, we, we kind of stay really on top of them each week. Um, after a session, we'll say, hey, this is what they learned today we need your help in staying on top of them. Sit, sit down and have a conversation with them about what they learned. What, what was the focus? What, was, what did they get out of it? And um, we, we've seen some, some significant success in having parents come back and say, uh, for us doing that, it's increased communication in their homes. It's, it's increased them being able to talk with each other um, about subjects that they may have found ha have been difficult before that. Uh, we still need some help in that area. Um, but we, we found that by doing that and sending those text messages out, sending those emails out and just pushing that communication ha has helped in, in raising that, I guess, awareness that those conversations are needed at home. You know, Dreams Academy, we, we see the guys from six to eight on a Monday uh, for eight weeks. That's in, in the grand scheme of things in, in, the, in the course of a week, that's not a lot of time. So we, we literally get, they're, they're eating for 30 minutes. So we get 90 minutes to kind of press in a lesson on, on whatever it may be for the week. So we really push our parents to keep fostering those conversations once they get home um, so that the, the, the messages don't go away. And if you have any helpful hints on how we can increase that, please let me know because I, parent interaction is, is something that, uh, is very necessary for the success of our kids. And this is one of those things that doesn't always work out depending on the household. We, we realize parenting, parents are, are busy parenting. So um, yeah, that's it. If it's okay. And also let me, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, cause I didn't say it on my front end remarks. Thank you ACF for everything that you've done for Dreams Academy. We, we wouldn't be where we are without you. So I just wanted to make sure I said that. I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Brandon, because I just uh, thought that was uh, so important about the connection and interaction. You often hear about the challenges during COVID-19, but everything we experienced wasn't, uh, wasn't bad. And one of the, I think, gifts that came out of uh, that time period is it formed a, a relationship. It reconnected us, I think, differently with each other and reconnected us as a school system and as educators with our families. We could not have gotten through all that we've been through in the last few years without uh, a stronger partnership. And so what we wanna do is to enhance that partnership, to build upon it, to keep the lines of communication going so that we're not only supporting our students uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're also supporting the families with the community support. So that's why those community resource centers, things of that nature become so important. But family members, parents, uh, caregivers, grandparents, uh, community persons who care or have just been heroes. And it really did um, us coming into virtually the homes of so many, it created an opportunity to really reignite the relationship. And we don't want to lose that. That's great. Superintendent Fowler Mack, another question from uh, Katie Smucker, who was on our board at ACF, is that how do we take the model of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the I Promise School and apply it uh, to some practices within all of APS? For instance, those family services, food pantries, hygiene pantries, and also, is there any way to keep schools open longer for after schools programs? Yeah, and we really do have, um, we have a bit of that going on now, but part of it is to get really systematic and to uh, expand that uh, in an even more intentional way. And so I think when we're talking about the family resource centers and things like that, that is taking a page from the I Promise model. And so there are a lot of very, very positive lessons learned there about not only services and supports, but culture, uh, school environment, um, and then uh, they too are taking lessons as we talked about earlier today, as we're learning from the Firestone cluster about what the strength of, of IB programming and really thinking about um, you know, the, not only the learning habits, uh, but also the experiences our students 
parents need. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we've created a larger learning community where you're going to see more more and more some of those best practices that are occurring right in our backyard being taken more to scale across our district. So, and we are looking to expand our after school uh, offerings are how we extend learning uh, even more and more. Just this morning, I was in a fantastic conversation uh, with the GAR Foundation, who's also working very closely with us and thinking about uh, what extended learning options looks like uh, as well as early childhood education, which is another love uh, of mine and I know of our system, we care very deeply. So be on the lookout to see more and more of those best practices expanding. Tracy, one that came in is what will be added to the Children's Museum in, uh, in the expansion? We are going to be adding a sensory room for uh, children with some sensory needs. So we're excited about that. Our birthday parties have really been on the rise. I think that families are looking for safe ways to be able to celebrate their children. And so we've had quite a few private parties where they can have the museum to themselves. Um, but we don't have our very own private party or meeting room. And so that is something that will be um, uh, part of the expansion. There will be a private space. And um, in addition to that, there will be a workshop space, a STEAM team, a STEAM learning lab. Um, so that's science, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics. And um, that space will uh, be for community meetings or, and even for you know, people that come in for field trips who want to have um, opportunities to learn. And we will also have a, a recording studio for children, as well as um, an uh, expansion of our wind and air um, exhibits. So, and a, and a family restroom. Restrooms are really important to people, a family restroom. That's great, Congra congratulations on that. Thank um, you. Uh, Superintendent Fowler Mackey, with in-person interaction still limited somewhat, um, one question is how do how do you weigh safety protocols for while not burning students out on virtual interactions? We've been very intentional about ensuring that um, there there is a balance that we're really thoughtful about screen time, um, and that we try to create still those interactions, but in uh, other ways of smaller groups uh, and we've been, we're, we're now I think a well-oiled machine in being creative about social distancing and our screening protocols, testing protocols so that we're increasingly able to have our students interacting in more and more environments. So, um, so I think we're, uh, I wouldn't say we're at a normal state uh, because there just is a new normal, uh, but we're, we're getting uh, quite adaptive and good at ensuring um, that kids don't just have to rely on screen time, um, rely on that, that medium. Excellent. I think we have one more, which uh, I, I can I can see how this one could be somebody something that we can all jump on to um, answer. The question uh, is in terms of uh, there being either research or there existing a comprehensive approach to addressing the COVID learning lag to connect and correct the impacts across the learning landscape and across all grade levels, uh, it, as well as bridging to higher education. And so I think it's great that, I mean, while it's something that uh, Superintendent Fowler, Mike, you can respond by yourself in terms of being comprehensive. I think it's important that we have uh, two of our out-of-school time partners here that could uh, weigh in on, on that as well. So I'll let you take it in, for, uh, answer it first, please. And then we'll see uh, what uh, Tracy and Brandon have uh, to add as well, please. Do you mind if I do the reverse? That's I, fine. I, I can bring better. it home. So Trace, <laughs> uh, can, it. Tracy will allow you to go first. <laughs> No problem. You know, I was actually, um, as we think about the um, 1800 kindergartners from the Akron schools that are coming to the museum, I was in conversation um, via email with uh, Kirsten Toth from GAR Foundation, and I was stating that there was a, a speaker that we wanted to have come from the Lego Foundation, and he just really talks about the importance of play, but not just the importance of children playing, but the children and the parent playing together. And so um, 
there is research. In fact, I was listening to NPR the other, uh, it was last week and they were talking about Imagination Library and the importance of um, children reading books, but not just them listening to the books. You know how we've got all our devices and the tablets and you just sit the child there and you're like, okay, press the story and let them play. They, there was research that was done and I wanna say it was out of the University of Cincinnati that talked about um, the effects of when a child hears you reading to them, uh, how that's different than the device reading to them. So, you know, we, the devices are nice, but to make up for the loss of learning, it's, it takes time. So you've got to put the time in. And so that's why it's wonderful that I know in some of the schools in Akron schools, there are those extended learning opportunities where the school day extends. And I think I saw a question about how can we have more of the I promise model. And, and, and there at the STEM school, we had a similar model with the extended learning opportunities that beyond the school day, there are fun things that children can engage in where they're still learning some skills. We talk about the 21st century skills and the 22nd century skills. And it just, it takes time, um, but we've got to balance that with play because we've got to think about the social emotional um, status of our children as well as our families. Because it's hard. It's hard on parents when you want them to do double work with the kids. Let's not do double. Let's just find creative ways to be able to extend that learning to make up for some of that loss. To, to expand upon um, what Tracy is saying about how they learn, I, I will first say there, there is no one way to address, you know, kind of learning loss and those sorts of things. And so educators uh, are engaged uh, often around the country in just sharing uh, programmatically uh, programs that are working. But I think all in all, having more uh, targeted uh, instruction, um, with support for students to really uh, address what it is that they uh, haven't learned that builds towards uh, learning of the future to make sure we're addressing those gaps uh, through targeted instruction, through high dosage tutoring, uh, things of that nature are really ways that we are addressing, but also uh, to make sure that our practices, because one of the things over time we continue you to need to work on in education is how we use time. So to include more mastery oriented so that we know when students uh, do get it and then they can move on without so much repetition uh, being involved within their, their learning experience becomes really, really important. So having more personalized uh, learning experience that really is targeted in ways uh, with supports um, so that we can intervene and extend uh, the experience and then incorporating that with a lot of what Tracy already talked about in terms of making sure that it's as experiential as it can be uh, so that there's still not only the rigor, but the relevance uh, so that we keep our students inspired. Uh, it's a combination of that type of programming, that type of personalization that really is going to help our students thrive. And Brandon, from, sorry, from, go, go from your interactions real quick, just share what has been effective in terms of um, interacting with the students and helping them achieve their potential. I think one of the things that's been really, oh, that was oh, Brandon, I'm, sorry. No. That was, yeah, letting Brandon jump in there. Go quick. ahead if you want to, though. I, I, come on, Superintendent. <laughs> um, for us, uh, I, I will I, I have to be honest, the, the virtual piece for us did not work well. Um, and I think that may have been in part, we hadn't mastered it yet. And so that would have been summer of 2020 when I think school was kind of edging out and the, the school year was ending. And for us, for our guys, I, I think the whole virtual piece, they were just tired of it, you know? And so um, I, I always say that I think we have to give kids a little more respect now because they're at some point they were literally sitting in front of a computer for almost eight hours a day. And I even know for me at 41, I struggled with some Zoom meetings that got a little lengthy. And so I, I, I can't, I, I respect them a whole lot for having to be, you know, kindergartners and, and having to do the whole tablet thing. That, that's a long time. Um, but as far as the learning for, for what our curriculum is at Dreams, um, 
you know, it's kind of hard to teach a kid how to tie a tie virtually, you know what I mean? And especially when we're so um, relied on that personal impact, that personal touch. I, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I just missed hugging my kids. You know, I couldn't see them. They need that. And that, that's what, you know, we couldn't high five. And, you know, the new thing now is the fist bump. And, you know, it's cool, but it, it's just not the same. Um, we had a session one time um, when we returned. And so what we did at Dreams, our, our maximum class size was 20. And so winter of 2020, I believe, when, when things had calmed down a little bit, we took that number down to 10. And we kept them spaced out and, you know, the protocols and all of that, uh, just because we, we just felt even we had parents say, my, my son just needs to show up. And so y'all need to figure out how to do that as safely as possible. And so um, it is for us is is far more personal, interpersonal interaction um, that means that that gets the lessons across. And it, it just means so much to our guys. And girls now, I'm sorry. <laughs> Great, that's awesome. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time here. Um, I will add that uh, at the Community Foundation in preparation for our education cycle, we did some research dating back the last couple of years. And, and besides the support that we give to Akron Public Schools, which is very critical and important, um, close to $600,000 was given to nonprofit agencies over the last couple of years that benefited Akron Public School students. We think that's phenomenal. And, and thank you to each and every one of our board members that is on the call today who realize that important, the importance of education as one of our four pillars of our board discretionary grant making. So we're very proud of that. Um, I will remind any of our donor advised fund holders that are on the line um, that if uh, there's still time for you to co-invest in any of our education grant that uh, you received notice on a couple weeks ago. So if you have any questions about that process, please feel free to reach out to any one of us, but we would love to have any of our donor advised fund holders co-invest with us on some of these important initiatives here in town uh, because we realize we can't, we can't fund them all. So uh, keep that in mind and reach out if you have any questions. And with that, I'll let Christina close us up. Thank you, John. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Brandon. We appreciate you all you. being here, your time, your expertise in uh, sharing the, the importance of uh, keeping with our children, right? We thank all of our attendees as well. Thank you for your time and thank you for tuning in. I uh, remind you that next quarterly cycle, we'll have the arts and culture community issue session. So also be on the lookout for that information. With that, have a fantastic uh, weekend coming up and keep staying safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.